I can literally say, okay, even if fear shows up, then maybe stepping out of your comfort zone and feel the fear and do it anyways is like the only thing that is left to do. Yeah. And, you know, having been there, I can say that was the best thing I ever gave to myself. Welcome to Great Conversations with Nicola O'Donoghue, the podcast where everyday individuals share their extraordinary stories of struggle, success, and the wisdom they found along the way. Are you feeling stuck in your life? Maybe you're not where you want to be. You want to make a change, but you're afraid you don't really know how to do it. Well, if that's you, this is the episode you have to listen to. Anita Montalalu is a phenomenally inspiring human. She shares with us this week her story of how she changed her life, talking so plainly and practically about how difficult it is to make a change, particularly when, like she had, you've, you're at a point where you're achieving so much professional and financial success. And what do you do when you wake up and you just realize that you're not happy and it doesn't bring you joy? She talks so candidly about how change takes time, which it does. It takes time, hard work and perseverance, but it's worth it at the end of it. There is no standard blueprint for change because I think that everybody is personal and we experience change in our own unique way. But what Anita shares in this episode, I think, can be inspiration for everybody. So enjoy, be inspired and take that leap of faith. Anita Montalalu, how are you? Welcome to Great Conversations. Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm doing, I'm I'm fine. Yeah. Thanks cool. for asking. How are you? I am really very good. Thank you. Very happy that you're here. Thank you so much for giving us your time. My pleasure. So we're going to get started. So you have a question that was left by the previous guest, and that's how we're going to start the conversation today. So Anita, what is the one thing that you love most about yourself and how does it positively impact the world? Well, it took me a long time to find the right words for what I think I'm I'm good at, but I think the word is holding space because, yeah, I'm noticing that, you know, sometimes people tell me stuff and I kind of sense that it's not advice that they're looking for. They're just looking for someone to, you know, be in the experience with them. Um, and I've I actually recently especially noticed that with kids, like I, I think they're so used to getting a lot of advice and then I just sit next to them and they tell me their their life story uh, or whatever they did during the day. And I'm like, oh, all right, all right. How was that for you? And just being there and acknowledging that it is what it is. I'm sensing that, um, yeah, that, that people like that. Or at least I'm I'm getting positive vibes from the people around me when I'm just you know, doing what I do. Wow. Being me, basically. Yeah. What a phenomenal gift. And so I would love to know what journey has that gift taken you on, Anita? Tell me about your life. I live in the Netherlands. I am a mom of two kids. Um, my husband husband's name is uh, Alex. Um, and my profession is a relationship coach. And I do that for businesses and for uh, family relationships. Um, and how did I end up there? Because that's what I do, actually. Uh, that's my profession now. That's what I do every day. Yeah. And I abs- abs- absolutely love it. Um, and I, actually, I have to say, I'm always thinking about how did I end up here? I mean, how did I get to this point where, you know, I, I honestly get to say that I love what I do? Um, and I think it's a combination of hard work, perseverance, and just dumb luck, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> which may seem or may sound a little strange, but um, I think I got lucky many, many times during my life. Um, and I think I was just ready for that moment. So um, I started off doing something that I wasn't necessarily very good at, which is um, going into uh, a, an academic career. So um, it started off at school. I was never the smartest cookie in the jar, but I was the one, you know, who when I wanted something, I just went for it. And so I think that that preser- 
per perseverance got me really, really far. Uh, but when you get that far, all of a sudden the journey takes you onward. And so I went to uni and I started studied economics, of which I'm still thinking to this day, why did I end up doing that? Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I have to say, I'm honestly, truly grateful for that journey, because if it wasn't for that, I didn't get the opportunity to ask the question, if not this, what then? Yeah. And what, how did you, like the perseverance that you talk to, how did that develop in the, the young Anita? Where did that come from? I got that from my parents because I think that the people I know that work the hardest are my parents. They are my example in that. I mean, the level of perseverance they had to show in order to end up where they ended up, that is just I have so much respect for that. And I think that they passed that on to me as well because they were on their journey and it took them as far as the Netherlands because my parents are originally from Indonesia. Mm. And um, the reason why they went to the Netherlands is to give my brother and myself an honest shot at life because there is a difference between life in Indonesia and life in the Netherlands. And at least here there was a sure bet and with here I mean the Netherlands there was a sure bet of us getting proper education. Mm. And we've always known, I think they've always known it wouldn't be an easy journey because uh, Dutch is not our, our native tongue. Mm. So when I was born, up until the moment that I went to school, I actually didn't speak any Dutch. I only spoke Indonesian. Wow. So I, I think they always knew it was going to be a challenge, but I think that was the reason why they planted that seed of perseverance like if you want it enough you will get there but you really have to work for it mm. and boy did I yeah. <laughs> um yeah so I think at, I have to admit at some points um at some uh, points in my life um there were moments where I thought well maybe this is too much of giving it my all and maybe I need something else but at a young age, I mean, definitely in my position, I didn't really have someone who would say that to me. Mm -hmm. And so I just took the road well known. And that was keep going. Yeah. Soldier on. It's difficult, but keep going. There's no time for tears. There's no time to cry. There's no time to grieve. No, nothing. Just keep going, however tough it may be. Mm, it's such um, a cultural um, message, isn't it? And way of of being that we talk about is the the stiff upper lip in Britain. And it really is. It's like, yeah. you know, you see all those, um, you know, those branded keep calm and carry on. I don't know if you've seen them. It's a very yeah. British thing and the mugs. And it's, yeah. it is so reflective of this mentality of, in just endure and just keep taking and taking and taking um, and going that is so without true. pausing. Um, that is so true. Yeah. And now that you mentioned that, I definitely think it is a cultural aspect because my parents came from very little. And so there is only one way to go and that is up, mm -hmm. right? Whatever that may mean. I never knew what that means, what that meant. But I remember that that message kept repeating your goal is to go up. You you must achieve more than we did. Yeah. Oh, I, I remember that sentence. Like it's so deeply engraved. Um, but like I said, I think that got me super far. Uh, but it took me a while in order to really reflect and think: Is that at all times helpful? Yeah. Is that what what you need or what I need? And that's what I was going to ask you because that type of mentality it, it it resonates. I feel it. I I lived it as well. And I'm really curious the the what did it both give you and what did it take as a consequence? What it gave me in terms of so back in the day, I was born in 1979. And at that point in time, I think the cultural belief was to have success, right? That's the epiphany of what it is that we were aiming for if we were to study for a long time and really ground our way through it. Um, and I think it has to do with financials and with having stuff. <laughs> yeah. And so what did it bring me? Everything I dreamed of. Like everything I dreamed of from the beginning, I got. But I think I paid a quite a high price for it because all of those things that you don't have time to look back on, grief, process, because you keep soldiering on, at some point, I think you pay the price physically, or at least that's what I believe right now. Mm. So 
Now, at some point, I started getting back pains because I just kept going, even though my body from the neck down was already saying I, I suffered very long, a very long time from back pains. And I, I didn't make the connection yet. It was in my, I think, late 20s, early 30s. I didn't make the body-mind connection yet, so I didn't know what, what was happening. I knew something was off, and probably it had to do with too much, too hard work. Mm. Um, but I didn't let it sink in deeply enough to think, okay, maybe stop, pause, and think about what you're doing right now, because maybe this is not it. Yeah. I just kept going until I literally couldn't. Yeah. So I spent like a week in bed because the back pains were so bad. The only position I could be in was lying down. But you know what you're talking to, Anita, is something that's so common. As you say, when you have that behavior where you're constantly striving and you're going, 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 eventually something has to give. And it's unfortunately a lot of us have to hit that proverbial wall um, before either our body steps in or something steps in where we're forced to stop. And so... Yeah, I'm sure what you're sharing is is just resonating with so many people. What I'd love to know, you've you've mentioned this um you've mentioned the word grief a couple of times. And so I'd just love to know, like, you know, if you had your time again, or what is it that you would have liked to have given space to grieve, or what was it that that happened that you just to yeah, I guess to sort of get you to the point where your body just said enough. Like Yeah. I think that. What I would love to have grieved is the fact that I'm just simply not capable of doing everything. I know that there are like these sayings that you can do anything you put your mind to. But to be really honest, I think that there are some things I'm just not capable of doing uh, because it doesn't bring me joy. Yeah. And I still kept on doing the things that didn't bring me joy because I was quite successful at what I did. I was like, crunching numbers yeah. and I make I made a good living out of it but was that my calling did it you know make me happy no not at all but just you know taking the opportunity or the time to say well maybe not this grieve that and then go through that grieving process and then move on to let's say better things I wish I would have I, I wish I did that more in my life Oh, you know what I'm hearing is that you're um forgive me if I'm imparting my um perspective onto oh, your story, but I feel as if the when you said that you ended up in bed and with your back, that the shift was maybe moving into a chapter of your life where joy was the driving force rather than this um this perception of success and particularly material success. And so, so true. I would love to know um how can we build more joy into our life what does joy look like what is it as a concept how can we have more of it why is it important beautiful question um if i really think of it i don't think that joy is actually an end destination i think that the joy is actually in the process or at least that's how I experience, uh, I experience it like to the ultimate level for me personally. If I truly enjoy, like at the end of the day, I can say, I had a good day. This was a good day. I talked to nice people. I was with nice people. I did things that made me happy. Um, uh, you know, taking every step and thinking, yes, this is the right direction. Even though sometimes, you know, you have to do things that you don't really like but it's serving my purpose. I think that that is what I would define as joy. It's in the process. It's not an end destination anymore. And I have to say, I used to think about that, you know, in an end destination kind of way, like, okay, if I grind enough today, then tomorrow I will have joy. But mm -hmm. it's like a carrot that's been held, that's uh, somebody holds in front of you yeah. that you may never reach. Well, you know, shifting my personal perspective into joy as a process and the same goes for success as a process that really helps me you know find my joy in whatever I do in a day talk to me about what that looks like in terms of the sort of day-to-day -day reality of joy as a process or success as a process so I love that yeah. you're saying it's not a destination I absolutely yeah. agree with you but then make it tangible for me please 
So what I think um, that no, let me explain it this way. What really helps for me um, in my mind, I think that that is what what my um, uh, like I told before, I did a master's in e- economics. And at first I was thinking, why the hell did I do that? But now, you know, being in my 40s, I'm now I'm realizing, oh, that was actually for a very good purpose. Because that I, I remember what I learned there is to think strategically. And what always helps me to drive myself forward, or at least, I don't know, it sort of brings the energy to go for something, is to think about a end goal. And, you know, not like feeling stuck to commit to that end goal, but naming something, go for it, have joy in the process. And if I don't feel the joy, take that moment, reflect and think about why am I not feeling this? Is it because it's difficult? Is it because actually the end goal that I named maybe a year, two years, three years ago isn't resonating anymore? And then I reiterate. And then I still have an end goal, but it's just a new one. So I'm not, how do you say that, attached to the outcome? Yeah. But I'm fully committed to the process. Yeah. I I genuinely think that we get so het up in the things that we can't control and we lose sight of of what we can. And that's what I mean about sort of sitting back and being a passenger in our life and not really being aware of the areas that we truly can control. And, um, yeah, you know, I don't, I, as, as a coach, I've worked with a lot of clients where, you know, they want to make a career change. It's the, one of the biggest things that people come to me um, for is I want to make a change in my life. Oftentimes it's career change. Oftentimes it's really difficult because by the time they come to me, they're senior in their profession and they have, you know, a lot of a lifestyle built around a, a certain income bracket. And it always, I, I, we always go through this lovely process and there's often a lot of resistance, but it's, it speaks to exactly what you're saying, which is the strategy, which is the plan, which is the process. It's like, I get yeah. that. Um, you don't have to quit your job tomorrow, but what are you doing to take control of being able to leave that? So that might be five years down the line, but what yeah. action are you taking now to put in place the structure and the ability so that you can leave your job? What are you doing financially? What are you doing from a skills perspective? What are you doing from a relationship perspective? And I and I do find that so often people get trapped in this cycle of woe is me or not taking control. And so what I would love to understand from you is obviously when you were working as an economist and as you say, you were successful and you had achieved what you wanted. How did you navigate through that transition? Talk to us about what your process was and and what happened there. Yeah. So what you were just saying when uh, working with people who kind of overthink their career and whether they might uh, might want to make career changes, that resonates so deeply with me because I was one of those people. Because even though you, well, no, let me talk about my perspective. So I was doing a job that I absolutely loved. The only thing was I kind of felt like I outgrown my position. And so that was for me the starting point to think, is there maybe more? But I think that um, like you, I coach people as well. And oftentimes we talk about their careers. I think what we have in common when we talk about career coaching is like the amount of anxiety that shows up when you have to rethink your position. Um, And I experienced that as well because I was like, okay, now I'm just coming up with random ideas that I would love to do in my life. But why would I do that? Why would I leave a stable job with a steady income, a good steady income that provides for my family and provides a roof over my head and all the luxuries that this life has to offer me? Why would I give up for some castle in the sky that I'm not even 100% sure I want to commit to and not even less than 10% sure that I can actually achieve that. There was so much anxiety showing up for me um, that I was kind of thinking, I've been on the fence on that for a very long time. I think it took me like a year, a year and a half to actually make the decision to take the leap anyways, because, you know, I'm also the kind of person that in the back of their mind thinks life is too short. (laughs) If I want to try stuff, I have to try stuff. But to be really honest, 
there was so much anxiety that that anxiety kept me where I was because it was convenient and familiar. Yeah. And what I'm hearing though is it didn't, it didn't. So you might not have taken action for a year and a half, but what I'm hearing is that you gave space for the anxiety and you were inquisitive. And I think that's the, again, that for me is still taking action that that for me is honoring this your your body is giving you the cues that something needs to change in your life and rather than stuffing them down you gave space and so yeah. that for me again is just that th it's exactly what I'm talking to you took control and ownership and um, and yeah let whatever come yeah. up come up with that I mean and what did you do so for that year and a half and for your anxiety what was yeah. what was the process there? How did you manage that? I really love what you're naming about giving space to something uh, because I'm going to build on top of that because that is exactly what me and my husband did, actually, because the both of us were thinking, OK, so we achieved what we set out to do when we were in our early 20s and we you know, had our diplomas and then the world was at our feet. And so we grabbed all our opportunities to build ourselves up to the point where we wanted to be. And then we got there and it was like, OK, so now what? <laughs> what else does the world have to give us? And so we were quite. Um, for quite a long time, we were both on a fence on it. And then we did what you just named, give it space. So what our decision was, quite practically, was we had the opportunity to take a sabbatical, just mm -hmm. the two of us. And so we said yes to that opportunity. And I really have to say my employer was phenomenal. And I think, again, I thank my parents for coming to the Netherlands where this is actually a part of the benefits when you work is you can take a paid sabbatical. And that's what I got. That wow. was what the universe gave me. So it gave me time. And even my boss, I, I had a very good conversation with her around, um, with them actually, because it was multiple people, because they asked me, are you going to come back after you've gone on your sabbatical? And I said, I'm going to be brutally honest with you. And just stay, say out loud, I don't know. Wow. Because uh, my boss knew, of course, that I was already on the fence about this topic. Um, because she also gave me a coach to think about it. Yeah. And that's what I love about hard work. Because she literally said, you know, you deserve this. You, I, I, I want you to have whatever it is that you want. Because you deserve it. And so she gave me that coach. Who gave me the opportunity to think about it for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And then actually taking the leap to go on a sabbatical. And I didn't leave the company immediately, but I did shortly after. Because when you take the space and time to get outside of your contact, so your like daily routine, uh, we went traveling. Um, I don't know if I mentioned that, but we went traveling and we specifically chose um, countries where we'd never been before. One of them being Japan. Oh, Talk about really wow. being out of context. For us, that was amazing because we were literally lost in translation and that was exactly what we needed. What I'm really um, sort of Im impressed by is your ability even within that moment when your, you know, your body had stopped <laughs> and sort of you was giving you really large cues that you that you stopped and were able to ask for what you needed because that takes a lot of courage it and there's two parts to it and it's the the intuition that you had the connection with your body to know what it needed granted it was giving you large signs because you couldn't get out of bed and your confidence and your love to honor that so how did you like what was it what is it about you what was it about that time that gave you the the courage to put your hand up and say enough or now I need this from you or I'm going to put myself because I think that's where a lot of people do get stuck as well is yeah. you know they, they might be hearing things but it is that fear that stops them from asking for the help that they need yeah yeah I think you're so right about that like it's so difficult to ask for what you need but I think that at some point, either it's physically or it's mentally or some other way, you will get enough signs where you literally feel you have ran into a wall and there's only one option. And that is to stop whatever it, it is you're doing. Mm -hmm. 
mm. be, it, because it will literally get you nowhere. And my nowhere was actually quite literally my bed. Yeah. Because if you are there, there's nowhere to go because yeah. you simply cannot move. And so I don't know. I, I think, I think you, you mentioned it spot on. I think it's like an intuition kind of thing because mentally I couldn't really make anything of it because it just simply wasn't there yet. Mm. And so I thought, okay, but something has to give because I'm not benefiting from me lying in my bed. None of my coworkers is benefiting from me lying in my bed and neither is my family. So where do we go from here? And now that I'm telling you this story, it may seem like everything is like clicking together, but we're talking about a time span of maybe like five years where the realization has, has to hit you a couple of times. Because, of course, you go to a chiropractor and he fixes your problem, exactly like what happened to me. But now in hindsight, I know that that's just like a Band-Aid in a moment of your problem. And it will help you carry on for another God knows how long of a period of time until you hit that wall again. And for me, at at the end of the day, was like chronic back pain. Do I want to live with this? This is not okay. And then that coach actually gave me some tools to really reflect upon that. And that's how I actually learned about the body mind connection. Like maybe this is not only something physical, but yeah. there's mentally something going on that is asking for your attention. And I took that quite seriously. So um, yeah, that's, mm. that's how we ended up, you know, making the decision. And I can literally say, okay, even if fear shows up, then maybe stepping out of your comfort zone and feel the fear and do it anyways is like the only thing that is left to do. Yeah. And, you know, having been there, I can say that was the best thing I ever gave to myself. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's the ultimate declaration of love, wasn't it? I think whenever you choose you and yourself, um, it is such a a declaration of of self-love. And I would l- just very curious, your coach, what are some of the things that she gave you? You said she gave you some things that helped. What were they? Can you remember? I was never really aware up until I talked with her about what the mind-body connection does with you. I always thought it was kind of like this woo-woo thing. I knew about it and I was sort of half open to it, but not really. Mm. And so she had this wonderful way of um explaining things very factual and still taking me out of my comfort zone and into the realm of imagine that how would it be like if what would you feel if um and the way she guided me through that really opened up my mind and i think that she made the safe the the space so safe that i surrendered into it even though it was kind of like far out of my comfort zone. Yeah. Wow. Sounds like she held a really beautiful um, space and process for you. For those who who don't know, would you mind explaining what is the mind-body connection? So um, the mind-body connection is um, how I, I'm not really the expert on this. So I'm going to try to explain it from how I experienced it. So the mind-body connection is basically sometimes when your mind is out of options to think its way out of a problem. And actually the only option is out. If you don't make the conscious decision in your mind to do it, your body will do it for you. So like I had a million reasons why I couldn't take time off to stop working because if I wasn't there, then the whole world would collapse, which is completely untrue. It is just an assumption, but it felt very true. Mm. And so I kept on going until my body said, and now we stop. We Mm. literally stop because I know you're trying to squeeze your way out of this, but I'm not allowing you to squeeze your way out of it. And so that is how it, how it worked for me, but also on a positive level, because this I learned from my PT. She's like the mind body connection also works in a positive way. If you're training your muscles, and you feel like you can't make the movement that she's asking uh, you to make, then in your mind, imagining using the muscles that she's asking you to use, and then keep repeating, because in the repetition, your mind and your body will start connecting, and they start understanding on a physical level what it is they're supposed to do. Wow. I know it is such a, we are fascinating beings, aren't we? I think that 
the connection between what we think, how we feel, how then physiologically um, that shows up in the body, how we behave. It's um, it's not, I think a lot of people um, believe it to be a, a one-way process of what we think then generates how we feel, which then generates what we do. But actually it's all interlinked. It's like a never ending circle. And so um, it doesn't work in that sequential <laughs> order. Um, and that's one of the things that I really appreciate about the concept of mind body is seeing us holistically. It is all connected. Um, and that's what's so important. And as you say, to sort of discount any one of them um, is doing ourselves a disservice. And so, so I would love to know the with the 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 wisdom and the insight into this mind body connection what did that bring to your life what was the gift in that how did then that determine where your life went to from there yeah Mm, so I've always known ever since I was very little that my intuition is super well developed and um, I used to think it was because of my background because you know Indonesian people like Asian people we have a lot of beliefs about the spirit world or the world that we cannot see and so that I, I was raised like that it was kind of normal for us to think that there was more than just you know what the eye can see and then um I kind of feel like my whole life I'm being guided into a certain direction and even though I can't really comprehend or explain with my mind and just you know with words why I know what to do my like my whole body from my neck down knows exactly what what to do it's like I have this golden chain around my middle and it's pulling me into certain directions and it has never failed to put me into places where I actually really really should be And where I get joy and where I get whatever the definition of success for me at that point is, I feel that this chain has been with me all my life, but it took me a very long time to trust it. (laughs) For me, what it's talking to is the is the power of intuition. It's this wisdom. Yeah. Like we, we so often think that knowledge comes from our brain and actually the, the intuition and the wisdom that sits within our body, whether it's heart, soul, gut, whatever it is, it's so much more powerful than what intellectually we know. And yet it, it is, we, we're not taught to cultivate that and to harness that because I think that it takes us, well, it takes us into different, on different journeys, doesn't it? it, it yeah. You know, when, when you're so connected to this ancestral inner wisdom and knowing, you make very different decisions because you're grounded so in a deep sense of who you are and you're less corruptible less likely yeah. to man- be manipulated you're driven by different things and um, you know as you say joy i think it also makes you more resilient right because yeah. when you make all of these life-changing decisions that seem to be based not on logic because why would you leave your job right yeah if it gives you that much stability then you get a lot of pushback on that as well because mm-hmm. it sounds so amazing But there's a lot of pushback on that as well, because people will always have opinions. But Mm -hmm. I think that if you get to the end of that tunnel, because it begins very brightly with this dream that you want to manifest. But yeah, there's no shortcuts here. You have to go through the whole process. And not all parts of the process are pretty. Exactly. But boy, when you end up at the end of the tunnel, it can be amazing. And I think that's what you're talking to is the... what I'm hearing is at some point you can't rationalize and think your way into something. You have to be guided by whatever you want to call it, intuition, wisdom, knowing you just, you, yeah, there has to be something that helps you bridge that gap. And I definitely have had experiences in my life where it has been that, you know, I've just acted instinctually and sometimes it's worked out, sometimes it hasn't. But as you say, there's always a process. Even if I've been guided by instinct or inner knowing, there's still a process that I've had to go through because change, there's there's a process yeah. you have to go through in order to process any form of change. Um, and what I would love for to understand and it sounds as if you're similar it sounds as if you know similar thing in your life it's sort of this mixture between being guided by your intuition and also you know intellect and that there's a 
there's an interrelationship between them. We know how to develop our brain wisdom with the books and everything we listen and we read and the education. What are some of the ways that you harness your intuition? Oh, beautiful question. Um, how do I harness my intuition? Well, first of all, I am, am open to the experience of intuition. Um, so being curious, I think that is a wonderful asset to have for anyone. Just be curious because my default mode used to be, okay, intuition, that's nice. Let's not go there because <laughs> it's not fact-based. And now I'm just open to the experience because whether I do something with the information or not, that's up to me. Yeah, but I'm willing to listen. Um, so that's one way to harness it and also to not dismiss it. Um, and I have to admit, I'm a ve very much rationale driven person because even though I now trust myself to be guided by intuition, I do use, well, I don't want to say statistics, but since I run my own business, it's statistics. I do check on myself like, okay, this manifestation thing, how is this showing up? How is it showing up in the numbers, right? Because having a goal and going on that path is one thing, but, you know, even though we all know that, you know, money is nice to have, but it won't give you like happiness, it will give you way of movement. Yeah. So if I'm depleting myself financially by, you know, going for that goal, and then losing everything, like literally everything along the way, then what am I going to feed myself with? Yeah. So I still have that rationale in as well, but I do it kind of simultaneously. So I listen to both parts. Like, does it make sense in my mind in order to go ahead and do this? How long can I try this out <laughs> in terms of energy, in terms of uh, finances, uh, in terms of happiness? And then also like, okay, Mar but what is my intuition saying to me? And if I put one and one together, if I try to align the two of them, where will I end up? Yeah. So I, I kind of try to work with the alignment of both, hopefully get the best, best of both worlds. Um, but at all times, I'm aware of that there's two things happening at the same time. And I love what you're saying, because I feel like that's often why people dismiss intuition is because it goes too far the other way. And it's it, what I'm advocating is exactly what you're advocating. It's the power in them both because they're both valid because you're right. Yeah. It's like it's like when people say um, you have to you know, live on purpose and pursue your passion and that's going to bring you joy and happiness. I'm always like, yeah. And because as you say, yes. you've got to make a living from it. How many people yes. have like, you know, left these big jobs and gone to set up a farm and they, they don't know the first thing about running a farm, but oh, they're passionate about it. Like, and that's what I love what you're saying. It's it's being guided by both. It's intuitively, okay, what am I, what am I passionate about? What do I think could be, you know, something that is what I'm here to do and would be playing to my strengths and my values. And I think that there's an intuitive wisdom in that and overlay that with, well, is it practical? Can you make it, can yeah. you live off that? Can you make money from that? You know, and I think this is often where, as you say, the, the, the intuition and wisdom becomes woohoo and it's dismissed. Be, be, yeah. And, and, the, the, the power actually in the genius is being able to harness both exactly what you're saying. It's being able to honor your inner wisdom and your intuition to help guide you to the path. And then it's using your brain wisdom and, and your and your intellect and the facts and the data to make sure that that's sustainable. To, because there's two sides of you to that, 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 well, not two, there's more, but you know, the sides that you've got to feed, you have to feed your soul and your passion and your spirit and your moral compass. And you have to physically feed yourself and put a roof over your head and provide for those in need and pay your bills. Whenever I got a compliment, it was usually based on intellect, right? Oh, you work at the university. Oh, you work with professors. Oh, you know a lot about research and da data and you work with companies and you advise them and so on and so forth. And so when I left that, or at least when I was thinking about it, well, the question that popped up in my mind was, okay, but who am I actually without that? Mm, yeah. <laughs> if I let that go, then what, what is left of me? 
And that was such an existential question. And I was like, oh, okay, let me think about this. So I really had to overcome myself, I think, you know, slowly but surely shifting into whatever this new version of me was. And I think that having a sabbatical gave permission to shedding whatever life or identity I had here in the Netherlands in my career, I would actually say. I think that that is a better wording for it. Who I am in my career, completely shed that, completely leave that behind, being totally disconnected from that, and then rediscover, okay, but who am I if I'm not that? Yeah. Um, and just keep repeating that question is I think what I had to overcome because it has so much of you as a person because I was completely pushed back into anxiety because at first I didn't even know what the answer was. If I'm not that, then what am I? Yeah. I don't know. And what will people think of me? Because people had opinions like, why would you leave a really good paying job? And, yeah. you know, you have certainty there. Yeah. Who doesn't like certainty? Um, so it was now that we're talking about it, I'm just realizing that the struggle is usually with myself mm. and that the biggest hurdle to overcome is yourself and whatever you think others believe about you. Yeah. And now I know that people don't really think as much about you as you think that they think about you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's like, there's that concept, isn't it? It's called the spotlight concept and it's, um, it's a psychological concept, whereas we, we, believe that exactly to your point that people are focused on us a lot more than they are actually they're wrapped up in their own narrative so um yeah, yeah we always think that we're in the spotlight and we're actually not we're, we're in the shadows um oh, and I love what you're saying because you're 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 right I mean gosh there's been many times in my life where I've had to question and look at my identity and that is really hard when you only know yourself as a certain job or as a certain part of a, a relationship it's really hard to then stand back and go well who am I without that or what am I without that and one of the things that has helped me is you know for those that, that can't take a t sabbatical and travel is just actually trying something new and a new hobby because often we get yes. not only with these identities we get trapped into these familiar routines and so it could even yes. be something because like I I haven't done this personally but I know people that have gone to improv comedy like stand-up comedy yeah because it's just something that they've or actually a really good friend of mine has um, joined a drama society like a, a you know an amateur dramatic club and it's I, it's just amazing because it's a way of rediscovering a part of yourself and and a, a different identity to what you're what you've been living for however many years so it doesn't even have to be you know for quitting your job or taking a sabbatical or going to travel exactly. it could just be in your day-to-day -day. or even one of the things that I do I always walk different places so when I was when I was studying for my MBA at Cambridge the the head of the program gave us a welcome speech and he said that his biggest advice for us in Cambridge was to look up and he was sort of saying it in a you know because obviously the beauty of the buildings within Cambridge and he just said you're like my biggest advice would be to look up and that has stuck with me throughout my whole life because we we just get so tunnel visioned again because it's routine like you know I'm sure you've had it I sit in the car and I drive to my mum and dad's house yep. and I'm like geez how the hell did Automatic I get here pilot. I'm just I'm, exactly and so I always have this look up it's just this little mantra and so because of that I like I force myself to walk different ways I force myself to always look around me because it's amazing even if you can't go different ways and you go the same way it's amazing what you see differently when you do look up exactly. and I feel like that's what you're talking to when it comes to identity it's putting yourself and giving yourself opportunities to d rediscover parts of your personality and and your strengths that you're that you're good at that then helps you be able to relinquish some of these identities that don't save you but that you're holding on to for fear of what is on the other side so true. And it also reminds me of something that sounds so like a cliche, but I think is so 100% true. It's that the, the most important relationship you'll ever have is the one with yourself. Yeah. Because if you can be with you, 
in whatever state that may be, then others can be with you in the state that you're in as well. But even better, you because you have been there, you can be there with others as well. And sometimes that's all that is needed, right? In a relationship, someone who can just, like how we started, someone who can hold space. Mm -hmm. You don't have to say or do anything, but just acknowledging the fact that whatever someone is going through is like a universal experience. We all go through joy. We all go through suffering. We all go through pain. We don't have to say anything about it. We just need someone to be a witness of whatever we're experiencing. And that in itself is already a gift. Yeah. But I, I do think that you're only capable of doing that if you're okay with whoever it is that you are. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's being, it's back to what you said earlier about your journey of giving space to your anxiety. You're also only able to do that if you can hold that space for yourself. Um, you know, that's to, to be in relationship and yeah. it, it might, it, it, you you have touched on so many beautiful words of wisdom i i am would love to know i'm so curious if you actually maybe i don't know though if oh god it's probably a bit unfair i was gonna say Not what good. would be looking back now what would be the one word that you would use to describe your journey of getting to who you are today and why that word one word. I know. I thought it might be oh a bit hard. Oh my goodness. I thought it might be a bit hard. <laughs> but I have to say, like, okay, again, intuition. Go like, on. after you ask your question, immediately a word in my mind popped up. Go on. Out of nowhere. Resilience. It is resilience. And why that word is because for me, resilience summarizes everything that you still have to gain. And it honors everything you've already gone through. It's like this one word catches past, present, and future in one word. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, it sounds very cool, right? Okay, yeah, I'm just going to do this. And uh, I just said no to my job and I just quit like that. No, yeah. <laughs> it's not how it goes. It takes resilience because resilience is what you need to be in difficult moments. Yeah. The difficult moments will make you whoever you are. Yeah, so resilience, that's my word. Oh, yes. Well, it is because as you say, it, it's you're always going to get challenges in life and, and resilience is what helps determine um, how you ride that. It's yeah. simple as that, isn't it? Um, exactly. Sure, I like that word. I'm so impressed that you got that one word. I'd still be <laughs> sitting here now thinking of mine. <laughs> Thank um, you, universe. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Nana. Um so I have a, a closing tradition on this podcast. Anita, what is one thing that other people value that you don't? I will admit I have to think long and hard about this one because this is such a good question. So, okay, this is what I came up with. I've listened a lot ever since you gave me that question. I've listened a lot around me to what people were naming was like one of the most important values in their lives. And there's one word that sort of resonates in a different way with me, and it's freedom. I think I have such a different relationship with the word freedom than other people do, because I kind of feel like a lot of people are harnessing that, chasing that, wanting that in their lives. And I don't so much for this reason. Freedom kind of feels like somebody has to give it to you in order for you to have it. Mm. And so for me, autonomy is, I think I hear less. So I don't know if people value that less, but it is what I actually find more important than freedom because having autonomy is free of anything where you are, in mind and where you are in in body and i have the, uh, how i came up with this word is because i was reading victor frankl's uh, book um what's that called again like the the thin one the one that he's written about his time in the concentration camps okay um and that he keeps repeating the message you know your mind will always be free even in captivity your mind will always be free and i also feel that about autonomy you are at all times in a position to choose how you react to certain 
situations. And I think that that was his mes- message from his book as well. So, yeah, mm-hmm. autonomy. Oh, do you know, it doesn't surprise me at all that you're that you value something that again has this control built into it this taking control of your life and your situation I really love that Anita thank you so much for your time I have really thank you so loved much for this. your beautiful question oh I've loved it thank you me too thank you Thank you to the amazing individuals who make great conversations possible. My editor, Stian Moritz, musician Jamie Jenkin, and our incredible guests for their openness. Our website, integrate.net, will be launching in September with loads of other exciting resources. In the meantime, feel free to click the links below for more episodes of Great Conversations. Sending you so much love. Bye for now.